many of you would be willing to be honest in church this morning? It's a good place to be honest in church. I wonder how many of you would be willing to be honest in church today and say that you have at one point in your life purchased a knockoff, an imitation, a counterfeit, something that may look like the real thing, but actually is not the real thing. You see, for me, it was that gold chain in high school. And I put gold in air quotes because everybody knows it was not gold, but it looked like gold. And so I was rocking that gold chain in high school, really proud of myself, flaunting it, just like wear the, the lower cut shirt, unbutton a couple buttons to make sure people see the gold chain, right? And I did that until my neck started to turn a little bit of a shade of green. <laughs> because it was a knockoff, it was a counterfeit, it wasn't the real thing. And I looked it up, that still exists. Like people still, I know none of you do this, but like people out there, they, they buy counterfeits, they buy knockoffs. And I looked up like just the top few in 2021. The first one, believe it or not, is still the fake Rolex. That, that status symbol, despite the fact that we got Apple watches and Fitbits, people still want the status symbol of what looks to be a Rolex. The second one were Yeezys. Now for our non-college students, Yeezys are these weird looking shoes that cost a lot of money, okay? And people buy what like a knockoff of, of Yeezys. And, and the third one was like Louis Vuitton or Gucci bags, ladies, you don't have to like, you can put your head down. You don't have to look at me right now if you buy those. And, um, and then the fourth one was so funny, it was Crocs. I love like all these rich status symbols for adults where, and it followed up by these rubber shoes for our kids. That all these parents are trying to find the knockoffs. Yeah, preach it, let's go. Let's find those knockoffs and spend less money on rubber shoes, right? But like, th this is what we know, right? Is we, we look for these counterfeits, but, but you also know, look just like I knew with my fake gold chain, that the counterfeit is made up of a different quality of ingredients and materials. It's not as robust or quality as the real thing. So what you know is it, it, la it works for a little while, but it does not last. It does not uh, fulfill the purpose that you had intended, right? It actually lets you down in the end. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, what, what Galatians is, this, this series that we're entering into, this book of the Bible, Galatians, it, it's this book that reveals a counterfeit gospel, a knockoff gospel, and an imitation gospel. And, and Paul, you're gonna see it from the start. He is passionate about protecting people from this counterfeit gospel because he knows even though it kind of looks like the real gospel, it is not. In fact, he's gonna say uh, blatantly in these first section of verses, there is no other gospel. There's no other, like you can try to imitate it, but there is actually no other gospel. And that's our sermon title for today. And what we're gonna see, and this is what I invite you into, is we go through these six chapters of Galatians, these 149 verses. You can read it in 30 minutes. You can bring back this journal every week, take notes. If you will allow this genuine gospel that Paul highlights to combat this counterfeit gospel. If you will receive, embrace deep into your soul, this genuine, real gospel, it will set you free. That's why it's our series title. If you will really embrace, I'm not saying you go to church. I'm not saying you call yourself a Christian. I'm not even saying you just join a team or get baptized. If you really embrace in your soul, the gospel of Jesus Christ and all of its power and majesty, you will be set free from the sin you're carrying, from the self-righteousness and from the shame. And so it's this beautiful opportunity that we have to lean in and, and be set free by the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Theologians have called the book of Galatians, the theological, um, I just forgot what I was saying. <laughs> uh, the theological declaration of independence. Come on somebody, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. The Mona Lisa of Christian liberty, right? It's like this, this Magna Carta of what does Christian liberty look like? That's these six chapters. That's these 149 verses. It's profound for our faith. It was profound for the Reformation that we celebrate on October 31st in addition to Halloween, right? It was profound. It all comes out of this book, Galatians, the book we're about to read, the book you're gonna bring back in your journal and take notes in, right? Amen. Okay, there you go. So let's lean in on this together. Let's start with me, Galatians chapter one. Get your Bible open, get your journal open. Let's read it together. It says this, Paul, an apostle 
That's his title. We'll talk more about this next week as Paul gives his bio, but apostle means sent one. He's talking about his authority, which he gets into right now. He says, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever, amen. amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort or pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He repeats himself, as we have said before, so I say again, if anyone is preaching you to a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If you paid attention at all, as I just read, you can see the passion, even the frustration from the apostle Paul. Right, and you need to know this is coming from a couple places. One is the love for the gospel, which we're gonna get into in a moment, but also it's his love for these people. You see, once you understand the background of Galatia and these churches, plural, verse two, these churches of the region of Galatia, you start to understand why Paul has this passion to protect them from counterfeits of the gospel. You see, Paul's first missionary journey was to the region of Galatia. Uh, the region of Galatia is a real place, by the way. Uh, it's modern day Turkey, which you can see on the map, uh, most likely the southern portion of modern day Turkey, close to the coast. And what you see is in Acts chapter nine, Paul used to be called Saul. He has this amazing conversion by grace, through faith in the resurrected Christ. And he starts going to other places. One of the first ones was modern day Turkey, this region of Galatia. And he starts to proclaim this grace of Christ that he has first experienced. And churches, people, believers start to pop up and they start to gather like we are. They start to be sent out to proclaim this gospel of grace to other people. It's this amazing thing. But not everybody thought it was amazing. You see some background as you understand Paul's passion and his protection for his people, these, his kind of firstborn, this first missionary journey, these churches of Galatia. Some background on that is you need to know the movement of the gospel started in a place called Jerusalem. Jerusalem, this Jewish center where a lot of Jewish people, Israelites, began to believe in Jesus Christ, that he really did live, that he really did die for their sin, that he really did rise again. And so they started to become Jewish Christians. But as you know, the gospel wasn't just for a certain type of people or a race or an ethnicity or a certain even locale it began to spread past Jerusalem powerfully to other non-Jewish people. Gentiles became Christians, people that weren't Israelites, weren't part of the, the chosen race of the Old Testament. And the gospel starts to spread to places like Turkey, places like Galatia, and these Gentile people who didn't keep the law, keep the Sabbath, keep the food restrictions. They believed in Jesus and they were saved by grace through faith. But then you had these Jewish Christians, some of them were called Judaizers, and they would infiltrate these, these new churches like the ones in Galatia, and they would tell these Gentile believers of like, ah, yeah, I mean, you believed in Jesus, but you just can't get into heaven for free. Like, you gotta pay your dues, like we paid our dues. You see, they were upset, like these guys, they hadn't been circumcised. They hadn't been following the, the rules of the Sabbath. They hadn't been following these food restrictions that the Jewish people had been doing all their lives. Right? It's like the person who doesn't study for the test, but gets an A and you had a tutor and you've been working like to the neglect of your friends and the TV and everything else. You've been working on this all day, all, all year and, and they get an A just for free. You're like, uh uh you tell the teacher like, no, they gotta study. They gotta be put through the pain that I was put through. That's what, that's what these Judaizers were doing to these Gentile Christians. And so Paul, 
his firstborn, like his first missionary journey, he gave them the gospel of grace that would set them free. And yet you have these Judaizers come along and they start to put them in bondage to the law and the Sabbath and food restrictions. So he's passionate right off the top. This is in his greeting, his first few verses. He starts to combat this counterfeit gospel. And he does it in two ways. Here's the first way if you take notes. He does it by pointing them to the genuine, glorious gospel. You see in the first sentence, he says, Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Right in his greeting, he gives you the gospel. Jesus Christ, who God the Father raised from the dead. He doesn't waste any time. He gets right into it. He wants them to know, hey, you've been hearing about this counterfeit. I gotta point you, the first words out of my mouth, the first first words on the page, they gotta be the real gospel, the glorious gospel. Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Because that's what they needed to see if they were gonna spot the counterfeit. See, some of you, you've worked at a bank or you've been a clerk at a grocery store or something like that. And people have told you like, you got to spot the counterfeit, all these counterfeit dollar bills and hundred dollar bills. And the way that you do that is how? You know what the real looks like. Uh, my youngest daughter recently, like all of our kids have piggy banks, but my youngest daughter recently, she, she broke her piggy bank and we haven't replaced it yet, right? Forgive us as parents. And so what we did do though, is we didn't take her money. Like we put it all in a a bag, a Ziploc bag. And so the other day she had these friends over and they were playing with what she called her money bag. And you just hear them talking like, get the money bag, the money bag. And you're like, is she a bank robber or a bank manager or a seven-year-old girl? Who knows, right? But she's just talking about her money bag. But you see, like you can clearly see it in this Ziploc bag. She's got a hundred dollar bill, right? She rolls like that you see like what the genuine looks like. And as you study that, as you look at that so closely, if you were to see a counterfeit, you could immediately spot it. That's what Paul is trying to do with the Galatians first. He's gonna talk about the counterfeit. But at first you gotta understand, and church, you gotta understand, God the Father, it's first verse, raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The gospel I know we get numb to this and we kind of look at it and we're like, ah, yeah, I know. I mean, I know that like Easter, I mean, that's, it's September, Tim, it's not Easter. Like, why are we talking about the resurrection? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel. And maybe if you don't see it as glorious, maybe you don't understand your need for the gospel. And so Paul's gonna remind them and you of your need. You see, he talks about sin and the evil of the present age. And I think most of us, we would agree with the second part of that. We would agree with the evil of the present age, right? We would look at our world and and everybody can agree, man, there's division politically, financially, relationally, there is evil. But where we would disagree is the source of that evil. And Paul says right here, it's, it's sin. He puts those two together on purpose. See, the reality is scripture's gonna talk about this issue of sin, the source of all evil, And many of us, we kind of know sin. Again, maybe it's a a church word that you used before. And you think of a sin as, hey, these things I don't do that I should do, or these things that I I, I do that I shouldn't do. And you kind of think of it as as external or moral. And the way we've said it at Phoenix Bible Church before is sin is not ultimately an issue of morality, but identity. It's bigger than you think. It's why you need Jesus to raise from the dead. See, it starts back in the book of Genesis as God creates everyone perfectly in his image with dignity, value, and worth, with purpose. And your purpose primarily is to worship your creator above all of his creation. And what we see with the first sin in Genesis chapter three, it doesn't take long, is you see Adam and Eve, they start to worship creation instead of creator. And you say, well, no, Tim, they just ate a piece of fruit they weren't supposed to eat. Yeah, exactly. They didn't trust their creator They trusted the creation to satisfy them over and above their creator. And so you have Romans chapter one that talks about this issue of sin as identity, not just morality. It's an issue of identity that people have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And again, you might say, well, no, Tim, it's just lust or it's just pride. It's just this, like I gossip, I use my words. No, your heart is corrupted with a different identity, that when you lust, when you have pride, when you have self-righteousness, when you have gossip, 
What you are doing in that moment is you're trusting, worshiping the creation over and above your creator. And that's why in Romans 3.23, for all of sin to fall short of the glory of God, and then Romans 6, the wages of that sin is death. Because it's not just an issue of morality, it's an issue of identity. And that produces all of the evil in our world. And listen, the Bible is really clear, for all have sinned, not for y'all have sinned. This is in each one of us. See, I think on a day like today, today's September 11th, 21 years after the bombings of the World Trade Center, or rather the planes flying into the World Trade Center, about 3,000 people from 100 different countries lost their life 21 years ago on this day. And I think it's really easy for us to look at that and be like, that is evil. Like those people over there are evil. And absolutely, it was evil. But the reality is what the Bible's gonna, I know this is uncomfortable, but Lena, the Bible's gonna teach us the same rage they had in their hearts exists in our hearts. You may not fly a plane into a building, but when you speak to someone that way online, it's the same rage, the same bitterness that for all have sinned, not for y'all have sinned. Do you see your sin that way? Until you see your sin that way, you will not see your savior the way Paul is trying to get you to see your savior. You see, in scripture, the the problem is directly related to the solution. If you have a a cut, you you need a Band-Aid. Like all of you parents, you know that, you got Band-Aids at the ready. If you need a cut, you just need a Band-Aid. If you got a cold, a Band-Aid's not gonna help you. You need like antibiotics, you need to go to the doctor. If you have cancer, you need surgery, you need things like chemotherapy. But if you are dead in your sin, which Ephesians calls us dead in our sin, Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. If you're dead, you need something else entirely. You need another person to rise from the dead, to beat sin, Satan, the grave and death, Amen? amen? And until you realize your need for the gospel, you won't appreciate the nature of the gospel. You won't appreciate this genuine, glorious gospel. So Paul, right off the bat, in the greeting, is trying to get you to pay attention to what the true gospel is so that as you see counterfeits, you will be able to spot them. Right? Uh, John Stott, a commentator on the book of Galatians, Galatians rather, I think says it really well. He says it this way. The gospel is not good advice to men, but good news about Christ. Not an invitation to us to do anything, but a declaration of what God has done. Not a demand, but an offer. Friends, you need to know, I don't care what your background is. I don't know some of you, a lot of you are new to our church. I don't care what your background is. I don't care if you have a church background or you don't, if you, if you send a lot in commission or maybe you just send a little bit in different ways like omission. Maybe if you have a self-righteousness or a full on shame because of your sin. I don't know what your background is, but you need to hear me. Your performance for God is not what gets you approval. It's Christ's person and work for you that gets you approval. That's the only way it works. You see, we say oftentimes like it's by grace, it's not by works. And that's true to some extent, but it is by works that you're saved. It's just not by your work. It's by the work of Jesus Christ. It's by what he already did. And now he gives you this invitation to look at the real, genuine, glorious gospel and embrace it and receive things like Paul talks about, like his grace and his peace in your life. It's only available through the work of Christ, through the genuine gospel. We have to see that clearly, and then we can spot the counterfeits. And that's our second point, the grievous counterfeit. Uh, Grievous may seem like a strong word to use, but it's not nearly as strong as the words Paul uses. Look at it with me, starting in verse six. Look at the word choice he has. He says he's astonished that they are deserting. Could have said turning, but he said deserting to a different gospel. Verse seven, I love this. He doubles down after he talks about contrary gospel, different gospel. He says, well, not that there actually is another one. (laughs) There is no other one, just so you know, even though I'm saying different and contrary, there is no other gospel. And then verse eight and nine, he really digs in. He starts cursing angels. (laughs) You see that? Twice he says this word, accursed, accursed. 
And there's another time in Philippians where Paul says, rejoice, rejoice. It's a little bit different, amen? Accursed, damned, condemned. And, and he includes everybody. He specifically says everybody, but he also talks about angels, just to make it really clear. Even if an angel came down and he preaches a different gospel, let him be damned. But it's not just angels. He says, if we, if we, like if I come back to you and I preach a different, what accountability, amen? If, I, if you ever hear me talking about something that is not by grace through faith, the cross of Christ, his resurrection, then you can damn me too. That's some ownership, amen? Paul is, is, is owning up to this fact like, hey, this is a big, big deal. If you follow a counterfeit gospel, if you give in to these Judaizers, things will not go well for you. It's a big deal for Paul. And again, we, we kind of see some parallels here between this passage and Acts chapter 15. So we're gonna throw that verse up on the screen. Acts chapter 15. We see in verse seven in Galatians one, there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Do you see that? Here's where that comes from. Acts 15 was around the time of the book of Galatians, maybe before, maybe after, but this is some of the specific issues Paul is trying to combat. Acts 15, listen to what it says. It says, but some men came down from Judea, these were Judaizers, and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And I love this. It says, and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension or debate with them. What's that saying? They, they basically threw down on this issue. There's no small debate. It was a big debate. You see that happening in the book of Acts and you see that happening, the results of that in the book of Galatians. And you know, why was this such a big deal to Paul? It's because he loved the gospel. Again, we've already said that, but it is because he loved these, these people. This was personal for Paul. It was personal in a couple ways. If you understand the background of Paul, Paul was once Saul. In Acts chapter eight, Paul converts in Acts chapter nine, sees the risen Christ, his life is forever changed. And then he starts going and preaching and proclaiming Christ and planting churches. But right before that in Acts chapter eight, it literally says Saul who became Paul started making a lot of trouble for the church. Galatians 1, 7 says, there are people trying to make trouble for you. See, Paul is saying like these Judaizers, like I know how they roll because I was one of them. I used to track down Christians and drag them in the streets. Read the book of Acts. He held the, the coats of the people who stoned Stephen, the first martyr in Christendom. It was Paul. You think he's passionate when he starts to see people doing what, what he did? What gripped him was so much bondage and what also put so many other people in bondage. Paul saw this firsthand until he was drastically changed by Jesus Christ himself. And again, it's not just that he's seen it up close in his life. These people are people very dear to him. It's his first missionary journey. He wants to protect them with everything he has. So he uses his passionate words. It's a grievous gospel. It's a distorted, a perverted gospel. You can't turn to it because he loves them, his first missionary journey, right? I know some of you parents, like you, you get what this is like, like with your firstborn, I, I have three kids. Man, it's just nothing like your firstborn. I, she was the one, I have three kids now, she was the one though that we read like six books every night before bed. <laughs> Right? She was the one we always had, had like full, like every Band-Aid in stock possible. Like every cartoon car character, every size, like, every, like we had it at, like always ready and willing to go. Now our third child, we're like, she's like, I'm hurt. And we're like, go get your own Band-Aids, right? <laughs> but that first child, you're like, man, you're removing all the, the hazards out of the house. Like, man, you're doing a remodel to your house for that one kid. It's your first child, Right? You wanna protect them. I remember one time specifically uh, with what's now my oldest daughter, she's 13, but at the time she was three years old and we went to dinner at these people's house and we knew one of them well, we didn't know the other people well. And there was these couple of little boys who were a few years older than her. And I can still vividly remember their stinky, nasty faces, right? These boys, and I was just, we're eating dinner. I'm trying to engage these couples, but I'm just looking out for my firstborn, my third, three-year-old daughter. 
And they're throwing this baseball, and I'm just eating, looking over, like giving them the look, like, better not. And then all of a sudden, I look over, and one of these boys throws a baseball and connects with my daughter's face, my firstborn, my three-year-old daughter. And I just remember, I would just tell you this, like, I've never wanted to throw baseballs at kids' faces. Like, that's not a part of who I am. But in that moment, I wanted to do exactly that. Like, that's all, I didn't do it. Don't call CPS, right? I didn't do it, but I wanted to do it. You're messing, you're messing with my first, that's how Paul felt about these people in Galatia. Like, you're messing with these guys, and he wants to protect them. It was personal, but it was also eternal. See, the Bible says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This isn't like a nuanced secondary theology that you get to debate over in your college philosophy class, okay? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the foundation of our faith. What determines whether you spend eternity in heaven or hell? And so Paul says, this is personal for me. This is eternal for you. And you need to get this. And you need to run hard from this counterfeit. And you need to embrace in a new way, a fresh way, a deeper way, this genuine, glorious gospel. And as you look at the the facts of it, when you see these Judaizers, you understand the context. They're like, hey, get circumcised. That was one of the things. Like Jesus plus get circumcised. Hey, hey, Jesus plus uh, eat the right foods. Jesus plus the Sabbath. And you might look at that and think, well, well, Tim, we love our Old Testament. Like, why are those bad things? And the reality is that they're not bad things, but they're also not God things. And when you, when you talk about them like they're salvation and it's equal to salvation, that's where they become bad things. When you talk about earning, not just effort, like, hey, we do these things, we observe these things, those are good things. But when you equate it with earning, like the Judaizers were doing, those are dangerous things, right? It, it messes up the, the, the purity of the gospel, it's like yesterday, my son had a soccer game. And anybody know, like it was hot and humid yesterday, right? Like the dry heat wasn't there. It was like it was humid, sweating out in the sun, playing soccer. My son was for over an hour, like hour and a half with the pregame, all that kind of stuff. And he comes home and he got a sunny D at his soccer game. And he's drinking the sunny D. And I'm like, bro, you should probably drink some water. My son, he's 10 years old, but he's a genius, right? He says, dad, he shows me the ingredients. There's water in this Sunny D. <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, and I said, yeah, but son, you, there's also syrup in the Sunny D. And there's all these other natural flavors. I don't even know what that is. And guess what? As soon as you add something to that pure water, you put the syrup in there, the other natural flavors, whatever else chemicals are in my Sunny D. As soon as you do that, what happens? It no longer fulfills the purpose that it originally had. In fact, if you drink sunny day all day after you spent an hour playing soccer and sweating, you're not gonna get hydrated, you're gonna get dehydrated. It has the opposite effect. Friends, if you put anything else in the gospel, well, just Jesus plus, I'm just dropping in there, some politics. Oh, just Jesus plus like a financial status, just drop it in there. Oh, just Jesus plus like worship style. Anybody? Jesus plus like whatever you drop in the gospel, Jesus, if you put a plus next to the name of Jesus, that's when you're off. Our world needs a glass of pure water. Our world in the midst of their sin and evil, we in the midst of our sin and evil, we need Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. We need Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and Jesus alone. Several years ago, when we first showed up to Phoenix, we we had some new people coming to our church because we had no old people because we were a new church. And so this older lady asked me, like, how are you, like, how are these new people coming to your church? How does it work? And at their church, they'd experienced a decline and all these other things were happening. And what she was asking me for, for was a strategy. I said, yeah, you know, we like have these connect cards and we have these cute graphics. Like, uh, thanks Nathan, early on, we had great graphics and like, yeah, we have a worship style and yeah, we have these ways for them to get involved and they need to be connected in like groups and stuff like that. And like, I was like, but it's the gospel. 
You see, they were at a point in their church where they were starting to change the gospel. They were starting to soften things in the Lord's prayer and change some of the wording. Like literally, this is what she's telling me. I said, okay, I can give you all my strategies, but you need to proclaim the Savior. People are, are dying and going to hell. And they're looking to the church for a glass of water. And we're giving them a, a sideshow. And we're sprinkling a bunch of other stuff in about politics and money and like your rituals and your worship style and your preferences. And, and people just need a glass of water. Amen? Amen? And that's how the church of Jesus Christ grows. And that's why Paul is so, so passionate for these people. So listen, I, I doubt, I seriously doubt, maybe for some of you, circumcision is a big deal to you, right? I, I doubt it is. I doubt even maybe for some of you, the Sabbath and like food restrictions from the Old Testament, I, I doubt that's what you're sprinkling into the pure water of the gospel. But there may be some other things. What are those things for you? What are those things in your life, but more so, what are those things that you put on other people's lives? Say, well, yeah, you believed in Jesus, but you gotta do X, Y, and Z. Well, yeah, you don't look like these other Christians that I know, so you need to, you need to get your act to, Like, what are those other things that you begin to add in? As soon as you do that, it's now a distorted, perverted gospel. It's actually, it's not gospel at all. And what people in your life, what you should crave is the true, the genuine, glorious gospel. Amen? That's where life is found. That's where joy is found. And that's where freedom is found. As we go through the series, 11 weeks, six chapters, 149 verses, over and over, Paul's gonna take us back to this genuine, glorious gospel. He's gonna talk about the place for the law. Maybe some of you are like, well, what, what is the Sabbath for? And what, what, are the, the, what are the moral aspects of the law for? Like, how does that work? We're gonna get to that, right? He's gonna go and dive into all of that. But what he's gonna talk about in Galatians chapter five, which is the title of our series is the gospel is meant to set you free. And I just believe some of you today need to be set free from self, some self-righteous things that you're adding to the gospel for you or for somebody else, from some sin in your life, from some shame in your life. And if you will read through this book and, and soak in, just embrace with empty hands of faith, the true, the genuine gospel of Jesus Christ, it will change you and it will free you. And it'll free some other people because that's the power of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the foundation of Phoenix Bible Church. That, that's the foundation of the book of Galatians. May that be the foundation of your life. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the gospel. God, I thank you for the ways that it just like a diamond, you can just keep looking at the different nuances of it and it's so glorious. And God, I pray that, that we would do that this morning, even as we respond and sing about the gospel. God, you would remind us of our need for the gospel, first and foremost, that we are dead in our sin and our self-righteousness. We're hopeless in the midst of our shame. And yet you sent Jesus Christ to live the life that we could never live and to die the death that we deserved. And that he rose again and he beat sin and self-righteousness and shame and even death in the resurrection. God, might we cling to that in a, in a new way, in a fresh way, in a more committed way. Might we embrace that a little bit deeper into our souls this morning. Might we respond and give you praise for everything that you have accomplished on our behalf through your gospel. And God, might we refute and run away from any counterfeit that may just be creeping up in our lives. Maybe we don't even see it right now, but God, you would expose that so we could see and embrace the genuine gospel and celebrate that today as a body of believers. How powerful would that be if people in this room begin to embrace the glorious gospel and then extend that glorious gospel to the people in our city who desperately need it. God, use us in that way by your grace. So in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen.